Our first case in property law is Tyler versus United States. And uh, if we look at this case, we see that this is a case involving a taxing situation. Uh, if you uh, review this case, you'll find that uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's, it's not very complicated. And one of the things you'll learn in, in your, your law school experience is that tax law is one of the most complicated areas of, of the law. Uh, not everyone who goes to law school studies tax law, but very often in you, when you are in, in law school, you will have cases that deal with, with the tax law. And it's a good thing because it's, it's very important to have some insight as to uh, how the tax statutes work. This is a 1930 case that originated uh, under circumstances um, whereby a, um, a husband had stock in a particular corporation and he decided that he wanted to share the stock with his wife. So what he did, uh, what he did was he created a, a tenancy by the entirety. Now uh, this is a, a type of tenancy in which both parties own the whole. Uh, and it's uh, very common in, uh, in, in American law uh, whereby you have this kind of tenancy. So what he did was he created this tenancy by the entirety. And uh, this was a, a West Virginia corporation that was doing business in Maryland. And what happened was he, he, he died um, uh, after he uh, created this tenancy. And the, the stock was taxed at the full amount, the full tax rate, upon his death. So his widow brought uh, a suit in this, in this case because uh, she challenged the constitutionality of the, uh, of the tax code as it was applied to this, uh, this taxation. It was her argument that uh, she was already the owner of the, of the tax. It wasn't a, a gift to, to her. She, she was already an owner of this tax at the time of his passing of her husband's demise and uh, she felt that it was, uh, she argued that it was unconstitutional. And uh, the court uh, makes a distinction between a direct tax, which is a, uh, a tax on property, and an indirect tax, which is, which is not. And it identifies uh, the central issue. And it says uh, that so far as the tax is based on the inclusion of the value of the interest in the estate held by the decedent and spouse, spouse as tenants by the entirety is an unapportioned direct tax and violates Article 1, Article 1, Article 2, Clause 3, and Section 9, Clause 4 of the Constitution, that such a tax, and, and Part 2, that such a tax amounts to a deprivation of property without due process of law in violation of the Fifth Amendment. So that was the argument by the, uh, by the widow. She was arguing that this is a, a constitutionally invalid uh, statutory imposition of tax. Um, now the courts, uh, the court uh, looks at the decisions of, of courts in Maryland and Pennsylvania, and it uh, talks about uh, tenancy in the entirety. And what you will have very often is, is, is situations whereby your case that you're reading will have a discussion about the law of different jurisdictions, and there often will be a, a choice of law um, issue that, that arises in, in your particular case. Uh, now, this case involved a situation that um, went to the Supreme Court. I mean, this is, this is a Supreme Court case, and um, the court has some very strong, well, not strong, but some, some very um, on-point language as to, as to what the issues are and, and what the precedents were. And um, one of the important things the court says was death duties rest upon the principle that death is the generating source from which the authority to impose such taxes takes its being. And it is the power to transmit or the transmission or receipt of property by death, which is the subject levied upon by all death duties. So that's a, a standard that the court cited from a previous U.S. Supreme Court uh, case, Milton versus Moore. And then the, the court goes on to add that a tax levy upon the happening of an event as distinguished from its tangible fruits, is an indirect tax which Congress, in respect of some events, not necessary now to be described, more definitely, undoubtedly may impose. So there you have the, the uh, court making the distinction between the, the direct tax and the indirect tax. And here's the, the issue that the court identifies. It says, if the event is death and the result which is made the occasion of the tax is the bringing into being of the enlargement of the property, property rights, and Congress chooses to treat the tax imposed upon that result as a death duty, 
even though strictly in the absence of an expression of the tangible, tangible expression of the legislative will, it might not thus be denominated. There is nothing in the Constitution which stands in the way. So basically, the, the court, under its you know, the, the doctrine of separation of powers, says that the, that the, the cons Constitution allows the Congress to impose certain types of uh, taxes of this nature. And particularly in this case, the court says the question here then is not whether there has been, in the strict sense of the word, a transfer of property by the death of the decedent or a receipt of it by right of succession, but whether the death has brought into being or ripened for the survivor property rights of such character as to make appropriate the imposition of a tax upon that result. So here he, he you have what the court is saying is the essence of this argument. Whether or not this, 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 the death um, is, is the triggering factor of this uh, tax. Um, the court makes some, some uh, reference to the fact that uh, the, what they call an amiable fiction and it's something whereby the court is identifying uh, the, the commonly held traditional view that a marriage is a union of two people and that this unit is, uh, is, is solid and that essentially was the argument in this case. The argument in this case that was asserted by the, uh, the plaintiff was essentially that uh, you know, she and her husband were united by marriage and that the, the tax was unfair because she's, she's being taxed or, uh, on something that she already owns and, and she considered that to be un, an unconstitutional, an unconstitutional fax, uh, taxation. And um, the, the, the court goes on to talk about the fact that uh, this situation in, in enlivened rights that the widow had that she didn't have previously. In other words, the court goes on to identify the fact that upon the death of her husband, she was able to dispose of the property as she would, as she, she wanted to. She had exclusive rights over the property. She could do anything she wanted to do at her sole will. And that uh, expression, exercise of sole will, was, was key in this outcome, key in this decision. So it was this exercise of sole will that uh, was important to the court because the court said, was saying that the death of the husband was an act which enabled her to have the exercise of her sole will over the uh, stock. And because of that, the resulting tax attributable to, su attributable to such property is plainly indirect. So there you have the court making this decision that this is in fact an indirect tax, and uh, they go on to I, I, you know uh, assert that this tax is of course uh, something that falls within the power of taxation that's granted to Congress. So there you have it.